take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. I love the book of Ecclesiastes, um, but it's one of those books of the Bible you can get wrong. You can take out of context. So if you're a cranky, grouchy Christian, the book of Ecclesiastes is for you because there's verses in there that you could absolutely take out of context. But the, the sermon title for tonight is, Why Am I Here? And you might be asking yourself that question right about now. Why am I here? Uh, part of being a parent, and you know, is teaching children basic things about the function of life. You taught your children how to use a spoon, didn't you? Or how to use a fork, uh, how to walk, how to go to the bathroom, how to read, how to write. There's a couple of things that you don't have to ask, uh, you know, teach your children how to do. And one of those things is you don't have to teach your children how to ask questions, do you? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Just comes natural. There's one question that every child learns, this little three-letter word. Look at this next slide. Why? Why? Because you like your head attached to your shoulders. That's why. Why? Why? Right? A lot of your early conversations, with you, I, did, I have not knocked my son's head off his shoulders, y'all, okay? But listen, a lot of your early conversations are like, go like this. You got to go to bed. It's time to go to bed. Why? How you got to take a shower. You got to take a bath. You got to school tomorrow. Why? It's time to get up. Why? <laughs> why? Why? Right? The truth is, though, you never grow out of asking those why questions, even as adult, adults. We often want to know why. Why? Why does a round pizza come in a square box? Why are you in a movie and on TV? I really want to know that one. You're in a movie, but you're on TV. Uh, why do we sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game when we're at the ball game? I've always wondered that. Right? Why do your feet smell, but your nose runs? And I found this. Why is the number 11, why is it not pronounced, the number 11, why isn't it pronounced 1D1? I think 11 should be renamed a 1D1. If Jimmy cracks corn and nobody cares, why is there a stupid song about it? Can I get an amen? There's all kinds of questions, but one of the greatest questions that we have to ask in life, and every human who's ever thought about anything for more than three seconds has wondered about the meaning of life. Why am I here? Why does life matter it doesn't matter different moralists and philosophers and uh, teachers and professors and every class of people that you can imagine have asked that question why 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 well really what they ask is who and why and what and where who am i why am i here what is right what is wrong and where do i go when i die and so i'm starting tonight with the assumption that you understand that you are created by god that God created everything. You're not just an accident. That a sovereign God created the universe and everything that's in it. And once you establish that foundational belief, the rest of the answers to all the questions just fall like dominoes that you have lined up. Uh, but if you don't believe that, it turns into one big guessing game for all of us. And basically, what, what it comes down to is this. In life, if you've ever taken a moment and said, why? Why, why, why uh, am I here? What does it even matter? There's only three options. The first one is this. There is no meaning. Nothing means anything, everything. Listen, all you can do is eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. That's one option. The second option is this. On the next slide, it says, I, I determine my meaning. In other words, I decide what meaning is. I decide what's meaningful. I decide what has meaning. I make those decisions for myself. And I decide if it's even right to know why. Or the third option, uh, the meaning of life is given by the God who gave you life. And a man who gave the biggest part of his life trying to find meaning in this life, this man that pulled out you know, all the stops, did everything he could to try to experience life to its fullest. He tried fame, fortune, power, position, education, experimentation. He tried sex, right? He had the world's best jewels, the greatest temple, the greatest kingdom. And all of that wrote this book called Ecclesiastes to help us understand what life is really all about. And at the end of the book, at the very end of the book of Ecclesiastes, he gives us the Cliff Notes version of everything he's been talking about as far as the meaning of life. 
And the beautiful thing about it is it doesn't matter if you've got position or power or jewels or rich or kingdoms or temples. You can know the meaning of life. Here's our key takeaway tonight. Write this down. Why is the question, but God is the answer? If you're going to live a life of purpose and meaning, God is the answer. If you want a life that's going to outlast your physical life, God is the answer. Now look in your Bible with me in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. This is everything. Solomon tells us what we need to do right up front. Number one, if we're going to, why? What's, what's the meaning of life? Number one, fear God. We're called to fear God. How do we live out and find meaning? We need to fear God. The purpose of your life is greater than your life. And I think humans know that atheist or Christian or whatever your worldview is, we instinctively know there's more important things than just us, right? We may not act like it. We may not live like it, but we know that this life is supposed to have meaning and the purpose of our life is greater than ourselves. Life doesn't revolve around you, what you can do for you and where you can go and what you can achieve and what you can have and what you can enjoy. Life is made up of more than that. The purpose of your life revolves around the creator of the universe who created you. And we were all, everybody, scripture's clear, everybody was put on this planet to have a relationship with God. We were created to connect with the creator. And Solomon tells us the bottom line, again, look at verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is man's all. He just sums it up, fear and keep, fear and keep. You probably heard the song, trust and obey. It's the same thing. Trust, I'm not going to sing. Trust and obey, for there's no other way, right? The place you begin is fearing God. The path that that will take you is keeping God's commandments. The destination to eternal life with God, it begins with fearing God. Now, I realize I'm saying fear God, and that brings up a lot of negative connotations, and you might not like it much, but it's in the Bible, and I don't care. King Solomon didn't mince words. It's not the first time he says it. Back in chapter 3, uh, he said the reason why God has done everything he's ever done for mankind, and the reason why he does everything that he does is so that we'll learn to fear him in the biblical sense. Look at verse 14, Ecclesiastes 3, verse 14. It says, I know that whatever God does, he shall, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing taken, away, taken from it. God does it. Why? That men should fear before him. Everything that God does lasts forever, and everything that he does is for a reason, and that reason is that we should fear him. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 7. It says, for in the multitude of dreams and many words, there's also vanity, uh, but fear God. Solomon just goes back, and he goes back, and he goes back. And later on, he says the way to maintain balance in life is to fear God. Ecclesiastes, look at chapter 7, verse 17 and 18. He says, do not be overly wicked. Just a smidge wicked. Oh, that verse has always cracked me up. He's like, don't be overly wicked. Just be a little wicked, okay? Okay. Nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you grasp this. And also not remove your hand from the other. For he who fears God will escape them all to fear God. If you want life to go well with you and you want the most out of life that God has to offer for you and the plan for his life, Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 12 says, though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him. Now understand what's meant by fear. A couple of things briefly, uh, uh, fear is healthy. Fear is a good thing. I know we try to convince everybody not to be afraid of anything. There's some things you should be afraid of. Fear is healthy. There's a reason why we teach children not to touch a hot stove. Right? There's a, there's a reason why we teach our children, good parents teach their children not to pick up a snake. There's a reason. They should be afraid of these things. These things can hurt them. There's a fear that children should have of their parents that's beneficial. Fear. When mama said, you just wait till your daddy comes home, I was afraid. That's good. There's two things that many children uh, fear with their, in and a, and a good, positive, biblical father-son or mother-daughter, mother-son relationship, there should be a couple of things. They should fear displeasing their parents and their discipline, right? They should want to please their parents. 
They should want their parents to be proud of them. They shouldn't want to displease their parents. That shouldn't be the goal in their life. They don't want to bring dishonor to their father or their mother. It's not just because of fear. It's because they love their dad. They love their mom. And they want to please their parents and honor their parents. But then again, a child should also fear a father's discipline. Loving parents uh, discipline their children. And of course, not to hurt them, but to help them. You know, if you do certain things, you're going to be disciplined. It's wonderful guardrails in life. The reason why so many children act the way that they do and so many children have gone completely off track is because there were no guardrails in their life. There were no boundaries. When the children pushed the boundaries, there was nothing there. And so they could go further and they could go further and they can go further. Safety and security is found within those guardrails. I know I've talked about this before as a child. Whenever I was disciplined, I didn't like it. Right? When I used to get whooped, I didn't like it. Not a bit. But when it was over, my favorite thing is it was over. Right? But you knew that there were guidelines and that they were there to help make you a better person and for your safety. You know, if you do certain things, discipline will follow. And that fear can keep you out of a lot of trouble. God's word is pretty clear that there are certain things we shouldn't be partaking of. And when we do, God's discipline is sure to follow. That should be something we desire to avoid. Let me say this and move on. The number one reason why in our culture today, uh, you know, it just seems like society is disintegrating uh, in so many different ways uh, is because, and the reason why we're seeing violence and crime and and things that happens in our school that we never thought would have happened and things with our young people and our homes and our families and our communities, things that we've never seen before. The reason why human life seems to be worth less in America in 2019 than ever before is because we have totally lost the fear of God in America. We're a nation that has absolutely, totally lost the fear of God. Politicians fear public opinion more than they do God. Students fear being popular more than they fear God. People fear criticism. I mean, my goodness, don't be politically incorrect in 2019. People fear criticism more than they fear God. Pastors feel, fear um, being unemployed more than they fear God. Look at this next slide. You've heard it said before. When you fear God, you never have to fear anything or anyone else. The conclusion of the whole thing, Solomon says, is to fear God. A healthy fear. Number two, write this down. And that will lead you to obey God. To obey God. Fear God and obey Him. I just love that picture of God. We're talking about fearing God. We know that it means the holy reverence of God. It doesn't mean the, like, the shaking in your boots and, and God's going to whoop you and he's the boogeyman and all of that. But he's an awesome, mighty, incredible God who should be feared. He should be held in awe and his power. There's no other picture you see in Scripture. I mean, I love the way C.S. Lewis, Lewis put it in the, um, the Chronicles of Narnia. When they're, they're like talking about Aslan, the lion, if you're familiar, he's a lion. And in this story, he represents Jesus, okay? He's a type, a picture, a symbol of Jesus. And they're like, oh, is he a, is he a, oh, a lion? They're like, yeah, a lion. Well, is he tame? And they're like, no, he's not tame. He's not a tame lion, but he's good. Listen, God is not some tame genie in the bottle for us. He is a mighty, awesome, miracle-working God. Now, he can do as he pleases, but he is good. And that kind of good God should be respected and feared, but also obeyed. The only thing that gives meaning to life is knowing God. You can't fear what you don't know. That's why children will touch a hot stove when they don't know any better. That's when a child will pick up that snake when they don't know any better. You were put here to know God. That's why God sent Jesus Christ so that we could know him in a personal way. You can only come to know God the Father through Jesus the Son. That's how the dominoes fall. Look at this next slide. To know God is to love God. To love God is to fear God. To fear God is to obey God. God. That's the order. When we know him, we're going to love him. When we love him, we're going to fear him, give him that respect that he deserves. And to fear him is to obey him. Look again at verse 13, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Now, the order here is super important. First, you know God. Number one, you know him. You love him, you fear him, and you obey him. 
You will never get to know God by obeying God. You'll never get to know God. You won't know God more intimately by obeying him. You'll obey God when you know him. Hear me. You're not going to be saved by what you do. You're not going to have an intimate personal relationship because you are keeping the Ten Commandments as if you could. Right? You will not get to know God through your good behavior. But when you know God, then your behavior changes, right? Then, and then uh, things that you desired before, you no longer desire. He changes your heart. First you know God, then you love God, then you fear God, then you obey God. That's why in the Bible, I challenge you to read the whole Bible tonight and get back with me tomorrow morning. In the Bible, faith always comes before works. Never, 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 not even once, not even the Old Testament, not even in the book of Leviticus, never does works come before faith. Never, not once. It's always faith and then works. Works never produce faith. Never have, never will. But faith produces works. And to fear God, again, it doesn't mean just simply that you're scared of God. What it means is you'll love what God loves. And you'll hate what God hates. God loves good. And God hates evil. And when you fear God, you'll love good. And you'll hate evil. When you love and fear God, you'll want to do good and you'll want to shun evil. To put it another way, when you fear God, you want to do what he wants you to do. And you don't want to do the things that he doesn't want you to do. Doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect, but that's your desire. That's what it means to fear God. Let me break it down. Look at this next slide. To know God personally is to fear God correctly. To fear God correctly is to trust God completely. To trust God completely is to love God supremely. And to love God supremely is to obey God totally. When we trust, you obey. Trusting God and obeying God, they go hand in hand. That's what Solomon said. Listen to it again, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Here's the whole thing. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. And I love, okay, I love it, I love it. For this is man's all. Uh, um, this is why the New King James translation is better than yours. Listen, it says, for this is man's all. Um, if you look um, in the, I think the ESV, a couple of other translations, it'll say, for this is man's duty, or this is the duty of man, something like that, right? Anybody got any of those translations out there? Nod your head at me. Isn't that what it says, duty or some other? Okay, that word's not in Scripture. Uh, that word duty is not there. The translators are trying to help you. They had to put something there. And in the original language, in, in the original language, here's what it says. It says, fear God, keep his commandments, for this is man. That's what it says. For this is man. What does he mean? He's like, this is what it means to be alive. This is what, this is the essence of being a human being. Right? It's, for this is man's all. This is the supreme act of being alive and being a human. Is what? To fear God and keep his commandments. This is the essence of being alive. It's not just our duty to trust and obey. It's the very meaning of life. It's what we were made to do. This is man's all. Fear God and keep his commands. For this is man. This is, this is what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. So therefore, number three, write this down. Fulfill your purpose. God has a plan for your life. It's to know him and to love him and to fear him and to obey him. And when you follow his plan, you fulfill his purpose. The reason why so many, so many people have so many problems and their life's so far off track and everything seems to be in disarray is because they were created for one purpose, they're trying to live for another. They were created for one reason, but they're trying to live for a hundred different reasons that have nothing to do with the one reason why God created them. I mean, what would happen if you tried to bake lasagna in your dryer? Try that tonight and get back with me. I'm not sure, but I don't think that a dryer is supposed to bake lasagna. Or what if we just filled our cars up on jello tonight instead of gasoline? Would it work? You'd have a problem. A desire wasn't a desire, a dryer wasn't made to cook lasagna. A car wasn't meant to run on jello. 
And no matter what else you do in life, if you miss out on knowing God, loving God, fearing God, and obeying God, you're not living for the reason why you were created. You've missed his plan. You've missed the purpose. And Solomon concludes, look at verse 14. He says, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. We're going to be judged as to whether we follow God's plan and purpose for our lives. For God is... Uh, plan for us is to know him through Christ and to know him intimately and by the power of God's spirit to follow his will for our lives to fulfill the purpose for which he made us that's how you're going to be judged look at this next slide your life is exactly like money you can spend it you can waste it or you can invest it you can spend it you can waste it or invest it You can spend it doing what you think is right or what you think is good. But if you don't know God, it doesn't mean anything. You can waste it by all the other things that you can do, but without God, it's a waste. Or you can invest your life by having the appropriate fear of God and keeping his calling for your life. What you did with your life is how you're going to be judged. Now, okay, we're talking about, I better clarify this. You're going to be judged. Now, for the believer, uh, you're not going to be judged for your sins That was judged on the cross at Calvary. Does that make sense? You've been redeemed. You've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. And if you're truly saved, you're going to be saved. Christ paid the penalty and the price for your sin. You can't lose that salvation, no matter how many times they try to tell you that you can. You cannot. It wasn't yours to earn. It's not yours to keep. Christ has declared you not guilty. But when we stand before God, it's not to be rebuked. It's going to be rewarded on whether the things that we did were good or bad, right? How the fear of God led to the obedience of God in our life. If you truly know God and you've got a a biblical, correct, holy, righteous fear of Him and a deep, passionate love for Him and a grateful, humble obedience of Him, the idea of this happening isn't something to dread or not to look forward to. But I think all of us probably do a little bit, right? Especially that verse... Go back to verse 14 for me, Andrew. Will you back up a little bit? It says, For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing. Every secret thing. Go back, go back forward, Andrew. Y- y'all remember this movie, um, uh, The Truman Show? Show that slide. The tr- you remember that movie? With, uh, uh, where, uh, and The Truman Show, what it is, this guy grows up, he thinks everything is normal. He's living his life and everything. What he doesn't realize, since from the time that he was born, he's on the world's number one TV show. Everybody has been watching his every moment, from the moment he goes to bed to the moment he gets out of bed, goes through his whole day, goes his whole life. He's married. He has a job. It's all just one big fake TV show. And everybody's been watching him. And he had no idea. Every secret thing everybody in the world saw Every private thing everybody in the world saw. Every public thing everybody in the world saw. It was telecast to the entire planet. And it was only at the end of the movie, uh, Truman comes to this gut-wrenching realization that somebody, a whole lot of somebodies that he has never laid his eyes on have been watching every second of his life. And that's not a very, really a good feeling. But the reality is the same thing is true for us. That even the secret things, that every second of our life, every second of every day that we have ever lived, we've got a heavenly Father that's been watching over us and He has seen everything, even the secret things. From the time you drew your first breath to the time you you draw your last breath, He's been with us. And He wants you to discover the one true meaning of life is to fear God and to keep His commands. To know him through his son, Jesus Christ. To love him the way that Jesus has loved us. And to fear him as the holy God who deserves to be feared. And to obey his commands. That's to be man. That's the essence to be alive. And it's the only way to live. And one of the ways, when we think about that coming time of rewards, whether what we've done is good, whether what we've done is bad, the secret things, and even the public things, as these things are judged and our rewards are distributed out as God sees fit. 
The most wonderful part about a day that's going to come like that is the knowledge that we can do something about it. That we don't have to, um, we don't have to go to heaven empty-handed. You can have rewards. Now, we're Baptists. We don't preach good works. But what I'm preaching tonight is good works. A real genuine faith, a real genuine holy fear of God, truly knowing God will express itself in the fruits of the Spirit. And when we have the fruits of the Spirit, that's going to show up in our lives, in the church, at home, in the community, at work, everywhere that we go. And what a shame it would be to be a believer in Christ and someday stand in front of Jesus ashamed and embarrassed. Because when he examines the secret things, he finds things in our life that have no business there. And they never would have been there if we really had an appropriate, holy, reverential, all fear of God that he deserves. He's not a tame lion, but he is good. And he deserves our love and our respect. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much that we get to know you and worship you and serve you, that you love us, that you care so much about us. But God, I'm so great. I'm grateful, Lord, that we can know you intimately, personally, that you love us like nobody else has ever loved us and you care so much about us and you know everything about us. You died for us. But Lord, I don't, I don't want our intimacy to become casualness. God, that we take your presence for granted, that we take your presence for granted in our lives. God, that I would ever lose that reverential awe, the holy fear of who you are. Because you are holy and mighty is your name.